Hi, this is Shane Morris. As we approach our fiscal year end here at the Colson Center, would you help us continue to equip individuals and institutions to bring restoration to their spheres of influence? You can support this work by giving at colsoncenter.org slash FYE23. Welcome to Upstream, where we make your worldview bigger and older by taking hard questions to the headsprings of Christian wisdom. I'm Shane Morris. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, reveal knowledge. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Over thousands of years, song and scripture have proclaimed this core belief of the Judeo-Christian worldview, that when we look at the world around us, we see, written in colors too bold to deny, the fact that God is creator. Yet, as we sit here in the third decade of the 21st century, the claim that the world reveals God can actually sound a little strange, even perhaps presumptuous. Western intellectuals have been engaged in a centuries-long project to deny that creation requires a creator. Darwinian evolution, materialist metaphysics, and theories about a universe that created itself have come to dominate academia, science, and popular culture. The God hypothesis, once such a potent explanation for all that we see in the world around us, has come to be seen by millions as unnecessary and even outdated. We're here with a live audience at the 2023 Colson Center National Conference in Indianapolis. The subject of this event is Earth Crammed with Heaven, and we're inviting you to encounter God through His mighty works. But in order to do that, I think we have to deal head on with this idea that creation doesn't reveal its creator. Today, I'm excited to welcome back to the podcast someone whose work powerfully affirms that the world we live in is not silent and that one of the best tools we have for hearing all of nature sing is science. Dr. Stephen Meyer is a philosopher of science trained at the University of Cambridge. He's a former geophysicist and college professor and now directs the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture in Seattle. He's the author of several groundbreaking books in the debate over evolution and intelligent design, including Signature in the Cell, New York Times bestseller Darwin's Doubt, and his latest, The Return of the God Hypothesis, three scientific discoveries that reveal the mind behind the universe. Dr. Stephen Meyer, welcome back to Upstream. That's great to be with you, Shane. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this morning we heard about the idea of disenchantment, that in the modern world it seems as if disbelief in God is a kind of default state. It's the natural frame of mind that you fall into. It's the water that we swim in, so to speak. If you ask someone on the street why they don't believe in God, many of them are going to gesture vaguely to science, as if science has disproven God. I want to ask a question that's deeply freighted with historical story, and I know you've written about this story. Was it always this way? Well, indeed it wasn't. The period in the history of science that historians call the scientific revolution, that is the period when science began to arise as a formal, systematic discipline for studying nature, in which there were systematic methods for studying nature developed, is typically dated at between 1500 and 1750, I think properly it should go back a bit further into the late Middle Ages, but this period of the scientific revolution was unique in human history in that these methods for studying nature were developed and then remarkable discoveries started to be made. Nature started to reveal its secrets. And this was a period that was dominated by a Judeo-Christian worldview. And many historians of science now realize that science not only began in a Judeo-Christian milieu or matrix or context, but it arose for specifically Judeo-Christian, even biblical reasons. For example, one of the key ideas that inspired the scientific revolution was the idea of intelligibility. 
that nature could be understood by rational human agents like ourselves because nature had been made by a rational intelligent agent, namely God Almighty, and God had endowed us with that gift of rationality. So there was a principle of correspondence between the rationality in the natural world, the order, the pattern, the lawful order that we see in nature, and the rationality in our own minds, that we had the ability to perceive the rationality of nature because our rationality issued from the same source as the rationality that we saw in nature, namely the mind of God, the thinking in the mind of God. This was a powerful idea that was expressed by many of the founders of modern science. Kepler famously said that the natural philosopher, which is what scientists were called before the 19th right. century, uh, he said the natural philosopher has the high calling of thinking God's thoughts after him. We're perceiving the design plan of the creator when we observe the harmony of the spheres or the design and lawful order of, of the natural world. So that was just one of many Christian ideas or ideas that flowed out of a biblical view of reality that inspired the scientific revolution, and th there were others as well. Well, there's a kind of why then, why there question that emerges, right? I think that's the phrase you use in the book. About the scientific revolution itself, why did it happen in Western Christian Europe in a certain era of history and nowhere else? I mean, there's no record of that kind of methodology. It, absolutely. This was first posed by a Marxist historian of science at Cambridge University named Joseph Needham. And he was doing good scientific method, isolating the variables. Why in Western Europe? The Chinese had gunpowder and all kinds of advanced technology for that era. The Romans built aqueducts and the Egyptians built pyramids. But nowhere else in the world were these systematic methods for studying nature developed. So why did it happen in Western Europe? And he came to the conclusion as a Marxist intellectual that Christianity was the key differing variable. Hmm. The idea of intelligibility came out of a biblical worldview. The idea that there was a lawful order, that there was a regularity to nature, yes, we could all kind of see that, but also that the regularity could have been different. This was the idea of the contingency of nature. Right. The Christian doctrine of creation, which was coming back into four in the late Middle Ages and during the period of the Protestant Reformation, the late Catholic Middle Ages and the Protestant Reformation both had contributions to this. And the idea was that they were rejecting the Greek idea of the eternality of matter, space, time, and energy of nature, but rather they were recovering the Christian idea that nature had been created at a particular point in time by an act of God that is, by a rational creator who could have made nature differently. Yes, there was an order. The Greeks saw that there was an order, but the Christian philosophers and early natural philosophers or scientists thought that the order was contingent. It was contingent on the will of God. I used to illustrate this when I was teaching by holding up four paintbrushes. And the Aristotelians would ask the question, well, what is the purpose for which something is made? They called it the final cause. In each case, the paintbrush purpose is that to put paint on a canvas. But each of the four paintbrushes was a little bit different, and it was used in a different application by a skilled painter. So whereas you could infer something about the nature of a paintbrush if you determined the final cause of it, if you determined mm -hmm. the purpose for which it was made, it still didn't tell you which of the paintbrushes that you were going to use. And so what the Christian philosophers of the late Middle Ages and the reformers realized was that nature had an order, but it was an order that was impressed on it from the outside. It could have been different. The Greeks thought of order as something that was intrinsic to nature. It was they called the logos. Mm -hmm. It was built into, and it was what seemed logically most, the order of nature was what seemed most logical to us. So they, for centuries, believed that the planets were orbiting in perfect spheres, even though the observations that they were making didn't actually match that very well. So they came up with this idea of circles within circles within circles, epicycles. And Kepler came along and said, well, wait a minute, maybe we should take the observations more seriously and realize that God didn't have to make circles just mm -hmm. because that seems most logical to us. Maybe he could have done it any way he wanted. And he determined they were actually ellipses. So there was this idea that nature was contingent on the will of the creator because it had been created. Therefore, it could have been different. And what follows from that is we have to go and look and observe to determine the order that is in nature, not deduce it as armchair philosophers. So that's just another one of the ways in which the Christian worldview contributed to the rise of modern science. It contributed to an empirical approach to studying nature rather than a deductive philosophical approach where we try to figure out, well, what is the most logical way things should, should be? Mm -hmm. Robert Boyle famously said, it is not the job of the natural philosopher to deduce what God must have done, but rather it is the job 
of the natural philosopher to go and look and see what he actually did do. Crucial shift. There are these immensely impressive treatments historically of the mindset of the founders of the you know, scientific method revolution. There's this theistic underpinning, like you said. So you, you demonstrate this thoroughly in your book. There are a number of other books, even one coming out shortly that, that's going to kind of demonstrate that same thing with Johannes Kepler. Melissa uh, Kane Travis's right, wonderful book. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, this is a clear underpinning of the early scientific revolution. And yet now we have scientific popularizers who are kind of universally known as spokespeople and faces of science. So Richard Dawkins comes to mind, right? He's the, he's the typical whipping boy in any Christian conference. So we're going <laughs> to uh, uh, talk about Richard Dawkins. But he's got this famous line, and you open with this because it is so diagnostic. It's in his book, River Out of Eden, I think. And the gist of it is that the universe we observe... Can I quote it to go you? Go for it. I, I, love for it. it. I, I actually love Dawkins. You, you'll get it better than I Well, I, I love Dawkins because he does such a beautiful job of framing the key issues. <laughs> and whereas there's this sort of passive default atheism, Dawkins has the courage of his convictions and goes right out there and not only defends his atheist materialist worldview, but he attacks theists for their benighted, uh, superstitious, irrational belief system. And I actually appreciate that because he sort of puts the issues on the table and invites an open discussion of them rather than simply uh, as a story from grad school. My first year in Cambridge, I was completely intimidated by the whole atmosphere. I'd come from a small liberal arts college in Washington state. And um, there was a, a one of the guys in our program was from Yale. And so he'd been to a more prestigious university, but he was even insecure. And we were at a, the pub after a seminar and he started to tell all the tutors and the supervisors, you know, about how he had rejected his religious upbringing and had become an atheist. Mm. And one of the most hip of our grad advisors says, well, he says, of course you're an atheist, but what else is, uh, what else is there about you that makes you interesting? He said, <laughs> and, the great thing about Dawkins is he doesn't just assume the atheism, he actually argues for it, mm. which invites an open discussion of the key metaphysical issues. And so here's the quote. He says, the universe we observe has precisely the properties that we should expect if at bottom there is no purpose, no design, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Now, here's why I love that quote so much, because what he's saying is that, first of all, blind, pitiless indifference is a shorthand for what scholars call materialism, the idea that matter and energy are the things from which everything else comes, and they are eternally existent, and therefore we do not need to refer to an external creator to account for reality. So materialism explains what James Sire, the famous worldview writer, used to call the prime reality question. Hmm. And the prime reality affirmed by materialism is matter and energy. They're the things from which everything else comes. Blind, pitiless indifference is just Dawkins' shorthand way of talking about everything comes from undirected material processes. And then he says, the universe has exactly the properties we should expect if that worldview is true. And so that invites a question. Well, is that true? Does the universe have the properties that the materialists right. expect? And what I did in the book, Return to the God Hypothesis, is show that the universe does not have those properties. It has precisely the opposite of the properties you would expect. And what I love about the Dawkins framing is that it implies that worldviews themselves are testable by observations of the things we see around us. He says materialism can be tested by seeing if the properties of the universe are those that we would expect if materialism were true. Hmm. And that invites the question, well, is that true? Is the, and so that's the question I took on in the book. So what was it that changed between the theistic founding of science and then this highly atheistic flavored view of science that even percolates down into the popular conceptions? It's a beautifully framed question because what we're encountering now with Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss and a generation back in Carl Sagan or with popular figures like Bill Nye, the science guy, or... I like to call him Bill Nye, the electrical engineering guy. guy yeah, right. well... Is that what he... Mechanical engineer? Nothing wrong with being an engineer, yeah, okay. but he's actually not a scientist. But <laughs> anyway... Uh, well, neither am I, so that's... Yeah. But we, we, play, we play them on TV with our bow ties. <laughs> In any case, you've got... And, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, I mean, there, there's this whole cadre of very popular popularizers of science who are telling the public that science properly understood undermines belief in God and either supports a kind of materialist agnosticism or uh, out-and-out -out atheism. Hmm. And what's interesting about that cultural phenomenon is that the worldview they're promulgating is actually late 19th century scientific materialism. 
it's not in any way based on the most current scientific findings. To me, it's kind of ironic that they're speaking for science, but as our friend Philip Johnson once said in a debate with Will Provine, he said, you have one of the finest minds of the late 19th century, he said. That was his, <laughs> and I, I think that's, uh, that, that's, that's the worldview they're popularizing. Uh, but you asked about what changed from the scientific revolution to the late 19th century, which is when scientific materialism really came into its, its heyday. Hmm. And I think a big part of it had to do with new theories of origins. Not all scientific questions are also worldview questions. Materialists and theists agree that the formula for salt is NaCl, okay? Right. But the questions about origins inevitably raise larger worldview questions. The question, where did things come from? And so in the 19th century, there was a series of new scientific ideas and theories about the origin of things. There was a theory about the origin of the universe that was advanced by Laplace. There were new theories in geology about the great features of planet Earth, the river deltas, the canyons, the mountain ranges. And there was, of course, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection and others, where the great events in the history of our planet, in our solar system, our planet, the history of life, were explained by reference to slow, gradual, unguided, undirected, and strictly natural processes. Mm. Darwin's theory, perhaps the most famous of those, but as a result of the success of those theories in the 19th century, those scientific ideas ended up underwriting a larger philosophy or worldview. Mm. And that worldview, scholars call materialism or naturalism, the idea that nature is all there is, the, and nature being made up of matter and energy. And so you have these materialistic theories of origin that, as Laplace put it in a famous conversation with Napoleon, he is called to the Palace of Versailles to receive commendation from the French emperor for this great new book he's written about the origin of the solar system. Laplace asks him why he doesn't mention God in the book. And Laplace is said to have puffed himself up and said, sire, I have no need of that hypothesis. Now, we're not sure if he said those exact words, but William Herschel, the British astronomer who was in the room, said that that was the gravamen of what he said. Okay. Mm. And this was kind of the spirit of the 19th century. I have no need of the design hypothesis. We scientists can explain everything by slow, gradual, undirected, and purely natural processes. Well, if that's your view of how everything came, it doesn't necessarily disprove God, but it makes the God hypothesis completely unnecessary. And pretty right. soon, if it's unnecessary, scientists start thinking, well, it's just simpler to explain everything materialistically. And that's, that's a big part of it. You have other materialistic thinkers like Marx and Freud. Darwin tells us where we come from. Marx told us where we were going at a materialist vision, a utopian vision of the future. And Freud had a materialist understanding of human nature and the human condition, human guilt. Mm -hmm. So between Marx, Freud, and Darwin, you have three great materialist thinkers who are answering the fundamental worldview questions that Judeo-Christian religion always answered. Where did we come from? Creation. Where are we going? Eschatology. And what do we do about our guilt? The whole doctrine of redemption. It's right. it, what Chuck used to talk about, creation, fall, redemption. Mm -hmm. Marx, Freud, and Darwin gave a materialistic set of answers to those three big questions. So by the early 20th century, scientific materialism becomes a kind of default way of thinking among, among intellectuals. And you're right, that has persisted with us to this day in, in popular knowledge culture. Well, it's become more than just a default way of thinking. It's almost like a, a ground rule. So one of the reasons that you praise Dawkins is that he's actually putting the materialist worldview out there for falsification, potentially, testing. He, he's saying, e evaluation. I believe it because that's yeah. what the world looks like right, to me, right? right? Um, but so often, you don't get that kind of response. So often what you get is you say the world around us reveals a creator, a designing mind in this way, in this way, in this way. And the response is not, no, it doesn't. The response is that breaks the rules. You're not allowed to invoke that because everything has to have a naturalistic cause. But is that a scientific assertion? Well, it's, it's asserted to be a normative principle of reasoning in the sciences that you must limit yourself to strictly materialistic explanations for everything, including the origin of the universe, the origin of life, and the reasons for human behavior. This is why we're thought to be completely determined, is that hmm. we have to explain everything by reference to undirected material processes. So there's no human volition or choice. This is why we've had what's called the diminished responsibility plea work its way into our system yeah. of jurisprudence. 
the assumption that you can appeal to your genes and your environment and your upbringing as the reason you did something and you don't any longer have moral responsibility because you didn't choose it because in the social sciences have adopted this principle. It has a fancy name in the philosophy of science. It's called the principle of methodological naturalism or methodological materialism. It just means if you're going to be a scientist, you have to explain everything by reference to strictly materialistic causes. Mm -hmm. You can't invoke the action of an agent to explain anything. But when you think about that, you can come up with all kinds of examples where that short circuits our view of reality. If you go into the British Museum and you go to the room where they house the Rosetta Stone and you look at those three sets of inscriptions in different languages, the archaeologists didn't say, hmm, must have been wind and erosion. Right. Uh, they, they realized right away it was the act of an agent. It was the act of a scribe because it was, it was linguistic. It was informational. And we know that information always comes from a mind. So, so yes, that rule, it actually restricts intellectual inquiry. Because right. the right answer about the Rosetta Stone is that a mind did it. But if you apply that rule of methodological naturalism rigidly, you have to rule that possible explanation out of court. So the elephant in the room is the idea about how elephants came to exist, and that is, of course, Darwinian evolution. And this is the one that interests a lot of people because it runs so contrary to one of the chief assertions of, of Christianity, which is that not just that God made the world, but that God made us, right? That, that we are the result of his designing intelligence and artistry and love. And so Darwinian evolution, as most people have understood it for, what has it been, like 180 years now? Uh, uh, asserts 164 okay there we yeah, go uh, he's better he's better at math than i am <laughs> that's it asserts that just as you would say that uh you know if you were a materialist with regard to the rosetta stone that, that wind and time and chance made this it looks at life and says that in essence blind forces that are undirected made this and the claim that many evolutionists have, have made that many neo-darwinianists have made over the years I think it's neo-Darwinist, not neo-Darwinianist. I, I added another <laughs> syllable there. Is that this makes it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. In other words, you can't look at life anymore and say, how did that happen? Because we have the means of explaining how it happened, allegedly. Give us the 30,000-foot view of how successful Darwinism has been in those years at explaining life. Yeah, your intellectually filled, fulfilled atheist is another Dawkins there you, there you go. Remember <laughs> Dawkins quote. He also says at the beginning of his perhaps most famous book, The Blind Watchmaker, that biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose, hmm. where the key word is obviously appearance. It's the illusion of design. Right. Why is the design an illusion? Because there's an unguided, undirected process, namely natural selection acting on random variations or we would now, modern biologists will talk about random mutations, random changes in the genetic text that have produced the appearance of design, but without that process being designed or guided in any way. So we've got an undirected process that mimics the powers of a designing mind, hmm. but is not in any way guided or directed. That is classical and modern neo-Darwinism. And that kind of explanation works very well for small-scale variations. I often use the example of some very woolly sheep in the far north of Scotland. And if you think about a sheep herder, in the 19th century, sheep herders knew about, went back to biblical times, people knew about mm -hmm. what's called artificial selection. If you want to get a woollier breed of sheep, what do you do? Well, you allow only the wooliest males and the wooliest ewes to breed. Mm -hmm. And then out of that group of offspring, you select the wooliest ones again and allow only them to breed. And you do that generation after generation and eventually get a very woolly breed of sheep in a very cold climate. So you now have the sheep is well adapted to the environment, but the driver was the intelligence of the artificial, the selector, the, the sheep herder. Darwin came along and said, well, what if you had a series of very cold winters? Mm -hmm. In each winter, you only the woolliest survived to breed. Wouldn't after 20 generations or so, wouldn't you get the same effect, a very woolly breed of sheep in a very cold climate? And so that was the idea of how nature could do what the breeder had done. No longer did you have artificial selection, now you had natural s selection. Hmm. So you kind of have to feel the force of that idea. What, what made Darwinism tick was that it seemed to come up with a mechanism that could do what intelligent agents can do. Right. The problem is that whereas small-scale adaptation of an already existing form can be nicely explained by natural selection, sheep getting woollier, 
finch beaks getting bigger and smaller in response to varying weather patterns in the Galapagos. That mechanism does a very poor job of explaining the origin of birds or the origin of mammals or the origin of insects, mm. the major groups of organisms. And there was a major conference in 2016 at the Royal Society in London, uh, the oldest and most august scientific body in the world. A group of evolutionary biologists convened a conference to discuss current trends in evolutionary thinking, but it was convened by a group of scientists who are essentially, they call themselves third way. They don't like the intelligent design idea that I and others represent, but they think that Darwinism has failed and that they were openly calling for a new theory of evolution because they recognize that this mechanism, natural selection acting on random variations, does a nice job of explaining small scale variation, but not major innovation. Hmm. And yet in the fossil record, we have these events where you get the first animals, the first birds, the first winged insects, the first flowering plants. And these types of events come about very abruptly and small scale variations don't seem to explain the origin of major new body plans. I could go into some of the science of that if you want. This is a, an increasingly recognized problem, not just among people of my persuasion, but within evolutionary biology itself. Well, I think it's really interesting because your first two books are really dedicated to two of the main problems. And you just mentioned one there. It's the origin of the new forms of animal life. So we'd refer to the, the phyla. I think there are, what, 26? Depends on how you count and, and, okay. and whom you ask. But yeah, there's about three dozen usually. Phyla represent the largest divisions of animal classification. Right. And each phylum would represent a common body plan, where a body plan is a unique organization of body parts and tissues. And so the arthropods that we'd be, if you know about crabs, you mm -hmm. know, the things with hard exoskeletons, the first arthropods arise, uh, the iconic form in the Cambrian explosion is the, the trilobite. And before trilobites, there are nothing like trilobites in the fossil record. Right. In fact, before the Cambrian explosion, there are very few animals at all. And then you get this proliferation of new animal forms that don't resemble things b before them. Trilobites have compound eyes, sophisticated compound eyes. I actually have a fossil where you can see the structure of that compound eye. Yeah. that well preserved. And that's a very sophisticated visual apparatus at the very dawn of animal life, and it comes out of nowhere. And so explaining how that could have arisen in the time allowed, uh, let alone where, the, the big question is really, where does the information come from to build a system like that? Right. And post Watson and Crick, we now know that just as in, the, in our computer science world, we know that if you want to give your computer a new function, you have to provide new code. If you want to give it a new operating system or a new program, you got to provide code. The same thing turns out to be true in biology. If you want to build a compound eye, if you want to build the proteins out of which the compound eye is built, if you want to build an exoskeleton, if you want to build a gut, if you want to build any, any of these anatomical innovations that arise abruptly in the fossil record, require genetic information and actually other forms of hierarchically layered information or control. And this is not well explained by the Darwinian mm. mechanism. If you just think of that idea of natural selection acting on random mutations, well, the random mutations are supposedly where you get the new form. Right. So think of a computer example. If you've got some code that's functional and you want to build a new computer program, if you start randomly changing the zeros and ones, the digital characters that carry the information in the computer code, are you going to generate a new program or operating system or are you going to destroy the one that you have already? Well, if you make enough changes, you're going to destroy the program that you have already long before you generate a new program or operating system. And the same thing turns out to be true in the biological realm. If you start with a gene for building a protein that's a necessary component of a compound eye, but you want to change that gene into building a protein for building something else, say a piece of an exoskeleton, right. and you start randomly fiddling with the A, C's, G's, and T's. In DNA, we have a four-character code. In programming, you have a two-character code. You start fiddling with the A, C's, G's, and T's. You're going to destroy the information for building the protein you need for the eye long before you build something else. Hmm. And so the mutational aspect of the mutation selection mechanism is something that is destructive of information. And yet we know that to build new things, you need new information. And, the, and you can run the math on this, and it's prohibitively improbable that you would, by random means, 
move from one stable protein structure to another, and you can't build anything in life without stable protein forms. So right. it's, it's, there's some really fundamental scientific problems that have arisen because we know more about what it takes to build new animals. And the most important thing we know we need is information. So information is at the heart of life. Meaning it's at the heart of life. And this then, analogy, is it, it holds. It's, it's not just an analogy. This is a precise description of the attributes of living systems. In the 19th century, when Darwin wrote his masterpiece, mm -hmm. Origin of Species, and it's a beautifully written and beautifully argued book. Yeah. He didn't know about DNA. He didn't know about the digital code it contained. He didn't know about what are called developmental gene regulatory ne networks, the circuitry that controls the timing of expression of genetic information so the right cells are built at the right time, the right types of cells are built at the right time in the right place. I mean, there's an elegance and sophistication of the underlying structures that make biological designs possible that was completely unknown in the 19th century. And in the 19th century, the scientists thought that there were two fundamental elements of reality, matter and energy. <laughs> and that gave rise to scientific materialism, the worldview. We now know there's a third fundamental element involved in all of life, and I would argue even at the foundation of physical law, and that is information. And information we know from our experience, from our uniform and repeated experience which is the basis of all scientific reasoning, is that information is a mind product. It always comes from a mind. You think of computer code or hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph mm -hmm. in a book or information embedded in a radio signal. If you trace information back to its ultimate source in any of those examples, you always come to a mind, not a material process. And so the 19th century worldview is inadequate because it eliminated mind as a fundamental aspect of the prime reality. It said, in the beginning was matter and energy. Hmm. And the biblical view is in the beginning was the word, where a word is a metaphor for information, which in the biblical view came from the mind of God. So the biblical view is actually more consonant, more consistent with modern science and its realization that information is fundamental and foundational than the 19th century materialistic worldview, which is the worldview that our friends, the new atheists, are still popularizing. So Alas. If, if there was a, a skeptic in the room, maybe there is, but if there was a skeptic of the claims that you're making in the room, and a non-theist, an atheist, an agnostic, I think that person would say, you just covered a lot of ground there. You moved from this critique of the Darwinian mechanism into essentially saying, God did it. And the, the common critique you get, in fact, it's like the critique of intelligent design, is that that's a God of the gaps argument. That what you've done is say, we can't explain it scientifically based on our current knowledge, therefore a creator did it. How is that not a valid critique? I'm delighted to answer that question. You may have noticed as I was covering all that ground, <laughs> This is why my, my kids say, you do go on, Dad. You know, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> write, write these 500-page books. You know. <laughs> Everyone keeps telling me, why don't you try writing a 200-page book next time? <laughs> um, but it's, partly it's because you have to address all these different objections. Right. And my first editor at Harper made the strategic editorial decision to let Signature in the Cell run long. Hmm. After it came out, and it was getting some traction. He called me and he said, I'm really glad that I let you let it go long because you bore a big burden of proof and you had to answer all these objections. So let's talk about the one you raise. The, uh, the uh, God of the gaps is a shorthand for, as you put it, the, log the logical fallacy known from informal logic as an argument from ignorance. One commits that logical fallacy when one argues in the following way. Cause A is not capable of producing or explaining effect X Therefore, cause B did it without offering any evidential support that cause B is capable of producing effect X and therefore could explain that effect if you saw it. Hmm. Okay, so it's arguing in a purely negative way without offering any positive warrant in support of the alternative explanation or cause you favor. Right. Okay, or hypothesis. Notice as I was explaining the case just a minute ago, that that's actually not how I argued, because I, I invoked something that was important to Darwin. It was called the vera causa principle, the true cause principle. What Darwin realized as an historical scientist trying to explain events in the remote past was that in order to explain an event in the remote past, he needed to cite a cause which is known from our present experience to have the capacity to, to produce the effect in question. Hmm. 
And they, that was in the 19th century, they called that the vera causa or true cause principle. And Darwin got this from a scientific mentor named Charles Lyell, the great geologist. Right. He, actually, the subtitle of his book was being an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. Those Victorian titles. Love, yeah, they, they put you to sleep. But the, the point is that if we want to explain an event in the remote past, Historical scientists today, building on Darwin and Lyell, realize that we have to cite an event which is known to have the power to produce the effect we're trying to explain, the effect mm -hmm. in question. So when I actually first encountered this explicit explanation of the mode of reasoning of the historical sciences, I realized that you could make an argument for intelligent design using this method of reasoning. Mm. And I ended up asking myself a question. What is the cause now in operation that produces digital code or text in an alphabetic form, which is what we have in DNA? Right. Well, it turns out, and this is the argument I make in the books, there's only one such cause that we know can produce information in a digital alphabetic or typographic form, and that is intelligence, its agency. Now, we know that because of our uniform and repeated experience of cause and effect in the world. And I gave a whole bunch of examples of it in my long answer a minute ago. Hieroglyphic inscriptions, paragraph in books, digital code in the software environment, information embedded in a radio signal. Whenever we see information and we trace it back to its source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. That's part of what we know about the cause and effect structure of the world that's been confirmed by our repeated experience, which is the foundation of all scientific reasoning and reasoning about the remote past as well. So we're not arguing from ignorance. I'm not saying cause A, selection and mutation don't have the power to produce new code, therefore intelligent design did it. I'm saying natural selection and random mutation do not have the power based on our analysis and observation of the process and how it works. But there is another cause of which we know that has the known capacity to generate the effect in question. And that cause is intelligent agency. We've seen intelligent agents generate information of the type we find in a DNA molecule, sequence-specific functional information, hmm. and that causes an intelligent agent. So this is an argument from knowledge, our knowledge of the structure of DNA, the effect in question, and our knowledge of cause and effect based on uniform and repeated experience, which is how we gain that knowledge scientifically. So it turns out that if you want to say our case for intelligent design is unscientific or if it commits a, a logical fallacy, you would have to say the exact same thing of Darwin or other historical scientists because we're using exactly the same method of reasoning. Hmm. And it's a reasoning that is based on knowledge, not ignorance. So biology is uh, one of the things you've really focused on with signature in the cell and Darwin's doubt. Like the one with the, the trilobite on the cover. I love that. Um, so you like the way it actually, it's got a 3D dimension so you can rub the... Yes, the, you can hold it up to the light and kind of see can, the, the can, compound eyes yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, cover, cover design is, I a, was, is as something a kid, you can really was, geek out about. Probably no surprise, but I was really into dinosaurs and trilobites and stuff. So when they gave me the cover with the trilobite, I said, can you make it kind of so you can feel the ridges on the lobes <laughs> of the... I said, yeah, we can do that, so... Beautifully done. That's my, I really like that cover. So, so this, this is biology, right? You focused yep. on biology a lot. Right, right. Sorry. But this is not the only line of evidence that you sort of marshal uh, to point to a, a cosmos, a universe, a reality that actually bears the fingerprints of a creative intelligence. And th there are two other lines of evidence, and we, we've had limited time here, but there are two other lines of evidence in your third book that you, you bring out, uh, Return of the God Hypothesis. And I think they're especially fascinating for this transition from a mere designing intelligence that could have been, you know, space aliens or something to a theistic God or, or something like a theistic God. Could you kind of yeah, drop those on us real quick and then explain why? Yeah, right. So after the first two books, a lot of my readers asked, okay, you've made this argument for a designing intelligence of some kind. Who do you think the designing intelligence was that is responsible for life? And what can science tell us about that? Hmm. So the third book, Return of the God Hypothesis, took that question on. And to answer that question, I thought it would be very helpful to bring in other classes of evidence. If all we have is evidence of design in biology, and we know that biological organisms on planet Earth originated sometime after T equals zero, the beginning of the universe, mm -hmm. it's at least logically possible that there could have been a designing agent within the cosmos that was responsible for the evidence of design that we see in living organisms. 
Now, I never thought that was a very good explanation. Oddly, there are scientists who have repaired to that explanation. Right. Richard Dawkins actually slipped and suggested it as a possibility in an interview at the end of the Ben Stein film, Expelled. He later regretted it, so I say he slipped. But it's the space alien designer idea. And it, I never thought it was a very good explanation because it doesn't answer the ultimate question of, as to the origin of information. Right. So the idea of, of, they call it panspermia, that life was seeded to planet Earth by an, an uber-intelligent alien on another planet, wh who or which itself evolved by an evolutionary process going back to the origin of the first cell on some other planet, which takes you right back to the question of the origin of the information needed to build the first life, which was the subject of my first book. But, but that one's cell. conveniently out of the access of observational science. Right. So. It, it's, we've not kicked the can down the road. We've right. kicked the can out into space. Okay. <laughs> right. So it wasn't that satisfying, but it was at least a logically possible explanation. Hmm. And so to foreclose that possibility or to examine it in a fair way, I wanted to introduce evidence from cosmology and physics. And here's the, here are the two big discoveries there are, first of all, that the physical universe, as best we can tell from multiple lines of astronomical evidence and from two different proofs that have come out of theoretical physics, suggest that the universe had a definite beginning, that matter, space, time, and energy themselves came into existence a finite time ago before which there was no matter to do the causing of the universe, as I like to say. And that's not, that's unusual. That's not something that people have always believed. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if at bottom there's no purpose, no design, nothing but blind pity. No, Mr. Dawkins, Professor Dawkins, the materialist did not expect the universe to have a beginning. Hmm. Remember Carl Sagan? The universe is all there is and all there was, ever oh, was, and all there ever will be, the materialist credo. The eternality of matter was part of scientific materialism, but matter had a beginning. Hmm. So this was a completely unexpected discovery from the standpoint of scientific materialism. It led Einstein into an elaborate attempt to circumvent the implications of his own equations, because he didn't like the idea of a beginning, because he had imbibed the default materialism of the late 19th century. Huh. He, he later said his attempt to gerrymander his own equations to avoid that conclusion was, was the greatest blunder of his life. But in any case, discovery of a, of a beginning, the second big discovery was that from the beginning of the universe, the basic laws of physics and the configurations of matter and energy or mass energy from the very beginning of the universe were finely tuned to allow for the possibility of life. Finely tuned and against all odds. In other words, fine tuning refers to well, it was the way some physicists talk about it is they talk about our universe being a Goldilocks universe. Everything is just right. The force of gravity, not too strong, not too weak. The force of expansion that causes the universe to expand outward from the beginning, not too strong, not too weak. Speed of light, not too fast, not too slow. Mass of the quarks and the other elementary particles, not too heavy, not too light. And all of these different parameters fall within very narrow and highly improbable ranges, such that if they were a little bit different, a smidge this way or that way, Life would not exist. Even basic chemistry would not exist. We'd all be living or not living, actually, in a big black hole. And so the physicists have wondered, how can we explain this fine-tuning? Some of the physicists who first discovered the, the incredible improbability of these parameters, for example, Sir Fred Hoyle, who'd been a very staunch scientific atheist, ended up arguing for intelligent design. Hmm. He said the common sense interpretation of the data suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics and chemistry to make life possible. I always say I like the way the monkeys make it into the origin scenarios. <laughs> you know? Can't stop uh, the monkeys. Even in physics. Point is, if we're thinking of two different design hypotheses, a transcendent intelligence beyond the universe, who is also active in the creation, which is the theistic view, or the space alien designer panspermia hypothesis, the space alien designer hypothesis cannot explain the origin of the universe itself. No being within the cosmos who evolves at a particular time within the cosmos can explain the origin of the cosmos itself. Mm -hmm. That would be getting the effect before the cause rather than the cause before the effect. And similarly, no being within the cosmos can explain the origin of the fine-tuning of the laws and constants of physics and the initial conditions of the universe that later make its very life possible. Again, you've got the cause and effect relationship reversed. And so if you look at all three of the 
key classes of evidence we have. The evidence of design we have, and for example, the digital code in life, in biology, the evidence of the fine tuning in physics, and the evidence for a beginning of matter, space, time, and energy at the beginning of the universe. A theistic designer provides a better overall explanation of those three classes of evidence than does a space alien designer. It also, the theistic conception of a creator provides a better explanation than a deistic creator Hmm. who acts at the beginning and therefore might explain the origin of the universe and the fine tuning, but a deistic creator by definition does not act after the beginning. So any evidence of design we have that comes down the timeline after T equals zero is inconsistent with the way a deistic creator would by definition act. And then there's problems. None of these things are explained well by materialism as a worldview. They're all unexpected on a materialistic understanding of reality. And Eastern pantheism has other problems explaining these things as well. So I do a kind of survivor thing where you kick the people off the island. You know, mm-hmm. it's philosophical. Yeah, yeah. You know, the pantheists fail for these reasons and the materialists for these. And at the end of the day, the, the worldview that's left standing that provides an adequate explanation of the major classes of evidence we have about biological, physical, and cosmological origins is good old-fashioned biblical theism, where we conceive of the creator as transcendent, powerful, intelligent, mm. and active in the creation. So the million-dollar question now is, given these lines of evidence, given the inadequacy of materialist explanations, explanations from within the box, or, or as C.S. Lewis puts it in Miracles, the whole show. The whole show. I, I yes, love that, excellent. right, yeah. Given that inadequacy, why the continued popular perception that science has done away with theistic explanations, the need for a God hypothesis, and the continued entrenched materialism in science itself? I think there's a default way of thinking that has a certain inertia associated with it. And it percolated in the early part of the 20th century into all of the knowledge culture, Mm. the universities, the science laboratories, the media, the law schools, the courts, the permanent bureaucracy. We have this interesting phenomenon in the United States of a worldview divide. And the knowledge culture, the elite knowledge culture is dominated by people who have accepted some form of naturalism. There are different forms of it. There's cultural Marxism. There's all you know sorts of things now. Right. But the denial of the existence of God, or at least an agnosticism which says there's no evidence for God, is pretty much a default way of thinking among the majority of people in those elite cultural institutions that shape our view of reality, thus the term knowledge culture. Hmm. If you go oh, to flyover country, I've met people at this conference from places in the country that I happen to love, Billings, Montana. I met someone in the elevator today. But, you know, in much of the country, the Christian world and life view is still very real, and there are people who fervently believe it and are acting on it. So there is a kind of divide, a worldview divide in our culture. But the knowledge culture was shaped by the ideas that came into those elite institutions in the 1920s and throughout the rest of the 20th century. So there's an inertia associated with that. Mm. I think now that the evidence is so strong pointing in the opposite direction, the continued dominance of that worldview, although it is it is weakening, is largely a function of the other side having a bigger megaphone. They control those knowledge shaping institutions, in particular the media. Mm. And I think one of the key things that people at for example, Breakpoint for years understood was the importance of broadcasting the other point of view, getting it out. And so we're at Discovery, we're working very hard right now on documentary science films, YouTube video shorts, all of the sort of an all of the above communication strategy because the evidence is there, the scientists and philosophers and scholars are there to make the arguments based on the evidence. We just really need now to, to get about the business of communicating. Folks, give it up for Dr. Stephen Meyer. (laughs) Upstream is a program of the Colson Center. When it comes to the hardest questions we ask, we have thousands of years of accumulated wisdom from which to draw, from a faith that is the explanation of all reality. So come upstream and learn to understand the world, the church, and the God who has placed you in them. Be sure to rate the podcast and subscribe in your listening app. You can also connect with us on social media and find more resources at upstream.colsoncenter.org.